So, good afternoon. Uh, earlier this year, I uh, started the first underhanded solidity code contest, and the goal was to uh, write code that looked innocent on the surface, but actually concealed a sinister purpose. Uh, the reason that I started this was to encourage uh, deeper thought about uh, smart contract coding practices and, and good code. Um, and to help highlight potentially uh, issues with uh, unobvious features in Solidity and, and smart contract programming. Um, so in an attempt to capture the sort of current zeitgeist, the theme was uh, token sales, and participants were challenged to write a contract that was in some way involved with token sales and looked innocent, but uh, had some advantage for the person running the token sale. Um, and ideally, the uh, sinister purpose should be uh, by, ignored by an auditor, or if it was discovered, then uh, easily um, excusable or explainable as an innocent mistake. Um, so I have here the three winners of the contest this year. Uh, we have Joao, who came in third, uh, Richard, who came in second, and Martin, who came in first. And so I'd like to start uh, the, our discussion about smart contract security by asking uh, each of the panelists to describe their winning, uh, winning entry and uh, what they think is novel about it. So uh, would you like to start? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, my entry is a proposal for a Dutch auction crowd sale. So in this model, um, the sale starts with a really high price per token that decreases continually as the, the, as the, as the time passes. So buyers can enter the, the sale in whatever time they feel the price is fair. Uh, the sale ends or, or when either the, the time finishes or the, cap, the, the or, sorry, or the cap is reached. So the, the thing is, I, ma I made use of uh, a feature of Solidity that is that anyone can forcibly send adder to a contract without triggering code execution. So in that scenario, um, the, the, the sale owners could sneak in some adder during the sale to inflate the, the, the token price, making the, the Dutch, Dutch auction end earlier. So if you couple that with, for example, a mintable token, that, that is a token that you only mint the amount of token that was bought, you can like uh, really inflate the token price because you put money on the, on the auction, but you don't mint tokens. So you're raising valuation of the token uh, artificially, regardless of marketing um, interest. And another detail is um, you can kind of use this as an, uh, as an influence because if people are watching the sale and they see uh, that it's, it's reaching the cap really fast, they might want to get in earlier than they would if in normal conditions. So, it's a kind of effective way to manipulate market in your favor using this, this little feature. Great. And uh, Richard, would you describe your submission? OK. Testing. There we go. Um, so uh, very similar. I actually didn't know about the suicide bug, which allowed you to get money into a contract without code execution. Um, but it basically uses the same idea, which is um, there was a, so the basic idea of the contract is you have a uh, a crowd sale, and the the uh, runner of the, the the runner, yeah, the issuer of the token gets one ether the first week, two ether the second week, four the next week, so on and so on. The idea being that if they're not doing what you expect, you can kind of yank your money back from them. Um, it comes down to using this dot balance, and so again, as long as the contract is executing as you expect, this dot balance can never be more than the amount you received. Um, unlike the suicide method, which again, I didn't know about, but I have more clever solutions now if I was new about that. The, um, basically, you compute the address the contract is going to live at before you deploy it, send ether to it, and now you deploy the contract. And now the contract actually is breaking the, the invariant that this dot balance is strictly less than the amount it thinks it has. Great, and finally, Martin. So in uh, my entry, I, I'm going to start by describing the bug. Uh, my entry is based on ABI encoding and how Solidity handles ABI decoding uh, in runtime. Maybe everyone doesn't know that actual the EVM and the code in, in 
a contract doesn't really have a notion of methods. Uh, that's a, an invention on top of the EVM. So on the fly, um, some bytecode determines what method is called and what the parameters are. And this is encoded via ABI. And certain types of parameters, such as dynamic, uh, dynamic length arrays, have a length. And that length is not enforced uh, by the decoder. So it's possible, I noticed, to specify a very, very large length um, and make the, this uh, value overflow. Um, and that's what I kind of designed my entry around. Uh, and it was a bit difficult because I had to make sure that during a loop, I can't loop against the size, but still use the size to somehow give a kickback to the attacker. Uh, and in the end, it became a kind of a round table where you can, um, a round table DAO-like thing, which you can pay for, try to get a seat on this round table and submit multiple bids and thus get the dynamic arrays in there. And what I think was pretty good about that entry is that this exploit is basically not possible to exploit using standard tools. You need to generate your own ABI, uh, your little bytes of data, uh, in order to exploit this. And I think it would be very difficult for a uh, Solidity contract developer or auditor without deep insight into how the EVM functions to actually uh, find the vulnerability. So uh, first of all, then, a question for, for any of the panelists who'd like to answer, which is uh, what should smart contract auditors be looking for uh, in order to try and detect these sort of underhanded tricks? Um, I mean, and I think in the case of our entries, if you see this dot balance anywhere, it should be, I mean, it doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's certainly a red flag that you're accessing data that may or may not be what you expect it to be. Um, to complement on this, there are a few things that, that tip me off. One example is random numbers because it's usually pretty hard to, to generate random numbers. And it, that kind of indicates that it's a point of failure. Um, uh, external calls are also a, a, a kind of security um, uh, edge because you know, you're calling external contracts. So it's the, thing, it's the kind of thing that I start looking after when I start looking at a contract. Yeah, I would like to add to that that what you really kind of should be looking for, or one of the things, is are these assumptions. Uh, and they're mainly implicit assumptions that are made. And it's easy to, to gloss over that and not notice it, but really try to investigate what are the implicit assumptions here. And in your cases, I guess the implicit assumption is that the uh, balance is zero uh, at the entry or at the exit and start to, to like make these assumptions explicit and then see can I violate this assumption um, in any way, shape or form. And just to add my own note, do you, um, some caution is required there in that if you made the assumption that the balance is zero and then you coded in an assertion the balance is zero, then now an attacker has a mechanism by which they can actually just disable your contract by sending some funds to it. Exactly. So, so I, I didn't mean that you should you know, assert that thing necessarily, but instead question, is this a valid assumption uh, that can be made, or can this be exploited uh, by an attacker? So uh, next question again for any of you is, uh, what sort of improvements would you like to see to tooling and to languages and, and other infrastructure pieces in order to uh, make it easier to detect these issues and, and um, help prevent them from happening in the first place? So on the tooling front, 
I was at the, <laughs> excuse me, at the breakout session <clears throat> earlier and saw some presentation about Oyente and about Securify. And for a long time, I've had this feeling that there are these tools um, to, which does analysis on bytecode <clears throat> and um, either detects vulnerabilities or provides some kind of, of analysis on the bytecode. Uh, and they're on the kind of fringes, but they're not right now in the, in the uh, tool set of most DAP developers. And that's what I think should be added so that as part of your development process, you can get some aid by these tools which operates preferably on bytecode, which would also help to protect against uh, failures embedded within the solidity in, in the step from source code to byte code. Yeah. All right, so you'd say more maturity in the tools we're already building and, and easier integration. Yes, in, easier integration um, in the, into the like, developer pipeline of these tools. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, I mean, I would, I would uh, yeah, that's basically what I'd say. Like, we, it's really important that we have better testing tools as well, like being able to run a huge suite of test cases against uh, both expected behavior and unexpected behavior. If you feed bad data in, do you still get a result and now you've corrupted something? Or like, I just think we need more. And I th again, I think the tools are there. I think it's just they're not easy to use. It's not easy to make a, a test suite and just run through them. You, you, you see all these contracts. They have about three test cases and it's testing. If I send money to this, not like this thing, does it work? Yes, it's passed. And so three test cases should not be sufficient to validate that this contract you're sending millions of dollars to is, is working. And um, yeah, it's a, go ahead. And just in addition to that, I would like to see uh, some way to test in large scale because most projects when they test some behavior, they use like the minimum, the viable number of players in the contract to test. But if a contract work like with 10 transactions, will it work with 10,000 or a, a million? And there's no way to test that. There is, but there is no, no one uh, doing that right now. So I would like to see some, some, some work on that. All right. Um, if you each could give one piece of advice to somebody writing a smart contract on something to look out for or something to be careful about, what would it be? Um, uh, I would, I would uh, give you advice that sometimes the code work as intended but the me mechanisms behind it are, are not. So sometimes it's not about the code, it's about the way you design your contract, about how intera people interact. You don't consider that that might be a malicious player um, interacting with it, that someone is like in a bad behavior. And it's kind of easy to oversight that and just like because it passes the test, it works, but you have to account for like bad people. Right, and I, I again would just mimic the same thing. I mean, formal verification everyone thinks is this magic bullet, but there's still, again, the game theory you have to think about. I mean, we've heard about minor front running. This is a great example of the type of things that the code is doing exactly what you expect it to do. There's nothing being lied about, about what's happening. It's just people who have weird connections to what's going to happen have too much say and can tweak what you expected to game theoretically or mechanism design wise work? Yeah, so my top recommendations would be know the EVM in detail and keep it simple. Don't build like very large inheritance models because it just try to keep it simple and much easier to audit. Uh, <laughs> last one dropped out. All right. Uh, so I'd like to, to see, uh, are there questions from the audience for the panelists? Uh, if you raise your hand and shout it out, I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear. <laughs> Nobody has any questions about smart contract security. Makoto. Hi, I've seen like many companies or individuals does like uh, code auditing, but 
uh, there's not much uh, standard. If you want to say, like, if we're going to have a code auditing standard or something, what kind of stuff should be on that standard list? So effectively, you're asking, uh, how would you recommend people go about auditing code? Is there, a, is there a best practice for that? Is that right? Yes, uh, best practices for auditors and, and audits. So I'll say there's been some work in that direction. I think mainly done by consensus. They've put together a, a best practices guide. Uh, but as, I mean, in general, <coughs> it's, the, the field is not yet mature. Uh, it's taken a lot of years to even get kind of like a rough web application security guidelines uh, going and it's still evolving. And it's the same thing here. Um, New things get added as hacks happen. Um, so, yeah, and there's, I don't know, it's, it's going to continue to evolve. There is one, but it's not, it's not all complete. Uh, one other thing, I, I, I agree we need something like that. We also need some, I, I would like the idea that auditing should be a fairly public type thing. I've done many audits and Oftentimes, I'll say like, oh, well, you you're, um, can be exploited if this character who owns this address does this thing. And often I hear the response like, oh, that's, that's the lead developer. He won't ever do that to us. And that's not accounting for him, A, being malicious, him or her, or them being uh, hacked and their computer's private key being stolen. So I, I too often hear in response to a completely valid audit, well, that won't happen. And that's, you're losing some of the value of blockchain. Um, so while well, we're talking about audits, at a very high level, would you describe how you go about an audit? Like, how do you go from here's a big chunk of code to, to here's a finished audit report? Um, oh, um, I would, I mean, usually, to be fair, most, most audits, I feel, aren't actually large amounts of code. Like, the DAO looked way larger than anything I've needed to audit before. That was, like, a lot of code for what it was doing. Um, but even with one issue or thing that actually makes this describing this process a little bit easier is usually it's very modular. Usually there is a whack ton of contracts that are all inheriting from each other, using each other. Um, so it makes it easy to kind of break it down and, and yeah, I, I usually just start at the top, go through it and kind of like how you browse Wikipedia. You hit like some weird class and you're like, I don't know what it means. And so you jump over that file and you go through that and it is, then you start popping the stack and get up and you have to go over it a few times before, yeah. That's a good point. The first thing you need to do is really understand what the code is doing. Trying to audit code that you're kind of like, well, I think it kind of does this. You really need to understand the assumptions the rest of the code is making. Um, I mean, going back, I guess, to a previous thing, another like thing I often see is, let's say you're counting the number of elements inside a mapping. I often see, you know, plus, plus, and then set. But this isn't, or in the other direction, minus, minus, and then set to zero. And this is a huge problem because if you set the same thing twice, you now think the mapping has two items in it. And so it, it's important to, to kind of be able to trace back and see, well, what code paths can get here to even do this? Maybe they're guarding it somewhere else. Maybe they're not. Maybe they should be checking. Like gas efficiency may or may not come to play. So I don't know if I really answered the question. What was the question? <laughs> Seemed like a good start. Uh, do you have anything to add, Martin? No, that's, that sounds very close to what I'm doing. I mean, it's very, it's extremely time consuming to do it this way, uh, but really get to know the code. Read it, read it, read it, read it until you know it forwards and backwards. And during that, and try to have this aggressive mindset where you know that there are flaws in it. You just need to find them. Cool. Uh, other questions from the audience? Shout and I'll repeat. Oh no, we have a microphone. Hi, so we heard from Piper yesterday about package management for Solidity um, and, and Python as well. Are you guys or anyone else looking into how we know if we can trust those packages, especially as the standard library might be replicated with different package sets? Obviously today in the development world we just hope the code works and then we realize it, it doesn't, which may not be as big of a deal when it's not Solidity. 
Well, that, that's an interesting question. Um, and just to, to add, uh, there's also the question that if you can we trust the standards? Because a lot of contracts interact with tokens, for example. And no one accounts for a malicious token that can implement the standard but can modify in some, some way that no, no, exploits the, the other contracts. So it's, it's, I'm not sure if I'm answering a question, but it's kind of a, 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 a bad, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's hard to really trust everyone. So it's kind of the, what Martin said, you have to be aggressive, you have to think that anything can break any time, you have to think that uh, anyone is malicious, anyone is bad, and it's kind of go this way, don't trust anyone. Is anyone thinking about putting in that package management system uh, the concept of this package has been audited and give some kind of, of, of marking of what company audited it and, of course, a, a reputation for that company? Is Piper here? <laughs> I, I, um, I mean, my perspective, at least, um, maybe I'm not supposed to have an opinion since I'm running the panel, but... Um, is that it's definitely true that systems like NPM are un unsuitable here. You know, you need a lot better control over the code you're running. Um, but I think step one, and as I understand it, FPM implements it, is you specify exact versions of the code, cryptographically hashed, you know, so you know you're getting the right code. Um, I don't know if any, any of you know whether the sort of metadata about auditing is, is in scope or not. Uh, whether metadata for whether a code has been audited and who it's been audited by is, is in scope for a package management system. I don't know what level of metadata is in. So I guess the question is ask Piper, <laughs> or the answer rather. Thanks. Uh, just over there. Um, I was wondering if uh, you guys are interested in any other uh, smart contract languages? And if so, what would they be? Are we interested in any smart contract languages other than Solidity, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, I did look a bit into Serpent contracts way back. Uh, did an audit of the um, BTC Relay. Uh, but it's right now, Solidity is the one which most contracts are written in. Um, but I think it'll be actually a refreshing change when Serpent hits the road properly. Or Viper. Oh, sorry, Viper, yeah. Yeah, I had a, a fascinating chat with the lead developer of Viper today. Um, it, it, I think it shows a lot of promise. I'd like to see more um, smart contract programming languages. I, I, there are things I like about Solidity and things I don't. I have a mental laundry list of what my perfect programming language would look like. And the reason I don't write it is because I'm aware that 90% of the work is the tooling, and uh, other languages are going to have a bit to catch up with Solidity before it's before they're uh, sort of at the same level in terms of tooling maturity. Um, but I don't think like Solidity's continued domination is in any way assured. Right, and um, so I'm working on my own like little language, but more as a side project than anything. Um, uh, Solidity is by far the most yeah mature and. It's all those other things on top of it that you really want. Like you want the the IDEs integration and like syntax highlighting. Like writing a syntax highlighter is not a fun thing, but it's something that you kind of want, and that's something you just have to write if you're doing your own like random stuff. I I, uh, I think another cool approach is to have languages which are less capable, uh, basically like Babbage, which I'm, and I don't know the details of this, but I I think that Babbage is a lot more restricted in what it can do, but can thus provide a, a greater safety about the you know, potential post states after the execution. Great. Uh, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. So thank you very much to my distinguished panelists. Thank you. Um, up next, we have another panel on formal verification moderated by Rito Trinkler.